Hi, and welcome to Failureology, a podcast about engineering failures. I'm your host, Nicole. And I'm Brian, and we're both from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thanks again to our Patreon subscribers. For less than the cost of a six-pack of wine glasses from Ikea, and definitely some other stores, you can hear us talk about more interesting engineering failures. So that's $5 a month. You can join our Patreon page. You get twice as much content, at least twice as many train tangents. You know, we like to talk about trains. And airplane tangents. And airplane tangents. It's a great time over there. Lots of really cool, interesting failures that are kind of a little bit maybe less popular. There's less information on them, but they're still really, really interesting. We're covering those over on that Patreon page. So come over there. Please support our show. This week in engineering news, a new membrane to better capture carbon dioxide. We hear a lot about carbon dioxide in our day-to-day lives, in newscasts, in daily interactions. So I feel any technology that, that helps to reduce CO2 emissions or reduces the impact of greenhouse gases, that's always a step in the right direction. And it just so happens that researchers at North Carolina State University have developed new membrane technology to allow for more efficient carbon dioxide capture from mixed gases. As we all know, carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide mixtures are fairly common in greenhouse gas emissions from power plants, and carbon dioxide and methane are common in the natural gas industry for emissions that they produce. This membrane that was developed by researchers at North Carolina State University is designed to remove the carbon dioxide from these mixed gases, which honestly sounds like a challenging task to me, mostly because that is beyond my level of engineering knowledge and expertise. Yeah, I mean, essentially you have this plume of exhaust with multiple different things in it, and you're trying to pick out one of those gases. It, it's it's like you make Kool-Aid and then you try to take the Kool-Aid powder out. It doesn't really work like that, at least not without some special devices and tools. Yeah, and and not only can they use this for, you know, for power plants and natural gas emissions, this could also be used to scrub carbon dioxide from air inside submarines and submersibles and other isolated vessels, you know, tanks that are out there. So so this seems like it has a lot of far-reaching impacts beyond just scrubbing carbon dioxide and methane emissions from power plants and natural gas stuff, which which I think is great. Yeah, there's there's also applications for buildings and other types of infrastructure that I think would be really interesting to see. And I think the other thing to think about here is if they, if when they find a way to scrub out the carbon dioxide from these mixed gases, you know, once they figure out that piece of the puzzle, I think that some of the things they're going to learn are transferable to other gases. And so it'll help them isolate other gases that they may need to to isolate or capture which i which i think is beneficial so uh this is pretty cool yeah and and the other cool thing um since this is a membrane you can remove um the membrane you know for free to replacement it's easier to scale um you know up to different sized applications it it's kind of like a a giant filter for your for your furnace but it deals with kind of the the carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases. So um, that seems like a a lot easier way to deal with this gases versus, you know, chemical absorption, um, which I believe some people are trying right now. And that requires bubbling, you know, mixed gas through a column. Um, But this has a larger footprint and it can be toxic and, and also corrosive. So the membrane approach, you know, assuming the manufacturing and membrane is reasonable, just overall, it's a much greener solution to carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So if this works, I can really only see positives coming coming out of this. Interestingly enough, when I was reading this article, and we'll have a link to it on the webpage for this episode at failureology.ca, I had assumed that the membrane was actually trapping the CO2. But that's not what they're doing. They're trapping everything else, and they're letting the CO2 go through the other side, and then it's captured there. So that's also a really interesting way to look at it. You're not capturing the gas you want. You're letting that go through. You're capturing everything else. And then what goes through gets, you know, separated off and and stored or or utilized for some other process. One of the challenges that the researchers were facing with this type of CO2 capture is permeability versus selectivity. So if you have a really selective membrane that captures everything you want it to, it likely takes a lot longer for the gases to go through it and to process through it. 
Whereas if you have a more permeable membrane, it doesn't capture as much. So it's a really fine balance to try to get as much of the CO2 as you can while still having the gases flow through at a reasonable pace. Obviously, if it flows through really, really slowly, then you probably need a much larger membrane. You probably need some type of containment area upstream of the membrane because the, the in theory, the mixed gases are going to build up faster than it could go through the membrane and potentially more fan power or some kind of increase in pressure on the upstream side to help push air through that membrane. So it, it's a balance to try to find the right level of capture. As I mentioned, if you want to read more on this membrane technology, check out the link on the webpage for this episode at failureology.ca. Hey, hun, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but Balls Falls Ostrich Egg Consultants has an exciting business opportunity for an excellent salesperson. Do you ever feel like you don't have enough excitement in your life? Balls Falls Ostrich Egg Consultants has an unlimited time opening on their team where you can make four figures a week. The first three figures are zeros. Don't put your head in the sand. You can be your own hashtag Bostrich babe. Now on to this week's engineering failure, the Teton Dam. The dam suffered catastrophic failure on June 5th, 1976, as it was being filled for the first time, which is coincidentally the same day that this episode's released. Imagine that. What a crazy coincidence. I can't believe it all just worked out like that. No one did that on purpose. That would never happen. I mean, it's, it's got like a one in 365 chance, right? Yes. Like 364 to one. So. Yeah, it, it definitely could happen. It's within the realm of possibilities. It's like 0.33% or something. Someone definitely ha probably has an Excel file that tracks all of those dates and, and things. No, I, I think it probably just happened. It, it's a coincidence thing. Yeah, total coincidence. It almost actually was a coincidence. It was it was close to June 5th, and then I shuffled a few things around because I thought that would be fun. The dam failure ultimately killed 11 people, 16,000 livestock, and it cost $300 million in claims, with the total damage expected to be close to $2 billion, which is really, really bad. Especially, this is 1976, so that's a lot of money now. It's a lot of money back then. In fact, the, the dam failure was so bad that they didn't try to rebuild it. They just left it the way it was and did not. There's no there's no dam at this location at, anymore. Which I think says a lot because dams are not a project that you just decide, oh, hey, next week, like, we'll, we'll just put up a dam. Like, these take years and years of planning and design and construction. So for this failure, or, or as a result of this failure for them not to rebuild this dam, this is very significant. Yeah, so speaking of length of time, the area downstream of the dam had suffered a severe drought in 1961 and then severe flooding in 1962. So this dam, at least as a concept, had been in the works for 15 years before the failure occurred. And the reason that they wanted to build a dam was to help them manage spring runoff. And they thought it was a really good idea and it made a lot of sense. And we do see similar things happening in Calgary. Right now, June, we call it monsoon June. We usually get a lot of rain in June. The other thing that happens is all of the snow that's been collecting in the mountains starts to melt uh, as we start to get warmer weather and we move, we move into summer. And as that melts, it, the water flows down the mountain and into various rivers and streams. And two of those rivers, the Bow River and the Elbow River, both flow into Calgary and actually combine the elbow drains into the bow, and then those head south of Calgary. And so the combination of heavy rainfall and a higher than normal snowpack is what led to our flood in 2013, which was nine years ago, later on this month. It was, I think, June 27th or something. It was a bit later in the month, but June is, is really common uh, for lots of spring runoff in, in Calgary. So I definitely understand Definitely understand what they're talking about here. Um, and I think, too, we've looked at building some dams for ourselves uh, just outside of the city to prevent the flood from reoccurring because it, it was very, it did cause a lot of damage. The projects are at various stages. I don't know too, too much about it. I'm certainly not an expert. I know there's been a lot of projects proposed. Some have gone ahead, some haven't, some are complete, some are still in progress. So definitely 
taking a multi-pronged approach to prevent the the flood from happening again, which which I think is really good. If you have one solution and that solution fails, then you're kind of hooped. But if you have multiple things working together, if one fails, in theory, the others will hopefully pick up the pieces. Yeah, like we've talked about so many times in this show, redundancy is important. You can't just have one thing that prevents a failure. It's like you need a backup. If that thing fails, something else has to take the load or it has to be able to spread the load to, to multiple different things so that way you don't have a catastrophic failure or a catastrophic flood. Like the, the flood in Calgary occurred, I believe it was a week or maybe a couple of days before the Calgary Stampede, which is a giant outdoor rodeo and exhibition that happens in Calgary. And there is substantial work that needed to be done on the horse race track and the venue facilities and the NHL arena where the Calgary Flames play just for those venues to be operational in, in time for Stampede. And it was quite destructive to um, our downtown core. There were a lot of buildings that had you know power structures and, and power facilities underground. Um, and all of that flooded, parkades flooded, you know, people's houses um, or, you know, kind of first, second story condos, um, those suffered a lot of damage. And some of the houses that quite large and expensive houses right along the river, they're, they're in a great location, but a lot of those houses flooded as well. Um, so we do see floods as, as very destructive events and, you know, things like dams and, and flood mitigation measures do go a long way in, you know, either preventing a flood or if there's a large rainfall event, extending out the impact of that rainfall or snowpack melt event over a couple of days so that the drainage systems that are currently in place can handle it. So dams are, are an important um, structure for flood control. So we're obviously pro-dam. We do love a good dam. There was some opposition to this project, though, from environmental and conservation groups. They were concerned about the impact on fishery and other wildlife habitats. And there was also concern um, for the economic return on investment. You know, dams are not cheap. This was by no means a complicated dam design. I don't want to say that it was cheap to build, but it was an earthen dam. So they essentially pile up a wall of dirt and allow the water to collect on one side of it and not pass through. There are more complicated dams that are like the Hoover Dam, for example, which is a concrete structure. It's a basically a wall, uh, a vertical wall that holds the water back. That's that's a lot more detailed and involved to design and to construct than an earthen dam. So after about 11 years of kind of back and forth and design development construction of the Teton Dam started in 1972 and it took four years to complete for a cost of a hundred million dollars. The dam was built by the Bureau of Reclamation which is one of eight federal agencies that are authorized to build dams in the United States. The Folsom Dam that we covered in episode 26 was built by the Army Corps of Engineers who also built the levees in New Orleans that failed during Hurricane Katrina but they ultimately turned the Folsom Dam over to the Bureau of Reclamation for operation and maintenance once it was completed. So we've definitely talked about the Bureau of Reclamation before. They're a fairly large body that looks after dams and I think other infrastructure within the United States. So as I mentioned, the Teton Dam is an earthen dam and it's located in Idaho. It's about a 1,000 kilometer drive from Calgary, which is a lot closer than I thought it was. I did I did Google Map. I Google Map all of these. I did google map this to see how how far it was and kind of where it was relative to calgary so it's about a thousand kilometers away which assuming you know 100 kilometers an hour it's about a 10 hour drive but i think with border crossing and everything else it's probably like a 12 hour drive so it's still pretty far away but calgary to vancouver is about the same distance so just for for reference i went one step further nicole in figuring out where this was it's actually 2400 kilometers from calgary texas it's a really long airplane ride from Calgary, Scotland, and an even longer airplane ride from Calgary, New South Wales, in case you wanted to get there from New South Wales, which is in Australia. That's a lot of Calgary's. There's at least four, because those were the four that I know of. There might be more out there, but I, I feel Calgary, Alberta is probably the most well-known one. It's, well, and the largest. And I mean, I might be biased, but it's my favorite. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I have not been to the other three yet, so I, I'm going to reserve my opinion just in case Calgary, New South Wales just knocks it out of the park for me. Okay. 
I'm not going to hold my breath. So as we mentioned and talked about earlier, the purpose of the dam was for flood mitigation, but they also wanted to use it to help with irrigation. As we kind of had talked about before as well, there's a lot of farmland downstream of the dam. And so having water collected for irrigation would be a lot simpler and theoretically cheaper than having to pump groundwater out of the ground or use use municipal water sources. On top of that, they also intended to use the dam to generate hydroelectric power, which is fairly common as well in dam construction when the water passes through the spillway to get from upstream of the dam to downstream, it passes through a turbine. As the turbine spins, it generates power and that goes back into the grid. That's that's pretty common. I think nearly all, if not all, dams have some type of power generation as part of their construction. So the Teton Dam was 520 meters wide at its base, 940 meters long. So it, this thing's almost a kilometer long, which is pretty extensive. That's a lot of dirt. That's a lot of truckloads of dirt to build this thing. Yes, yes. And it was 93 meters tall. That's uh, like 31 stories tall. It's, it's, it's over 30 stories. So, yeah. so if you live in a large city, a lot of commercial skyscraper buildings, um, you know, office towers in a, in a downtown area, they kind of clock in, you know, in that 25 to 40 story range. So just think of it as a, uh, you know, an, an earthen structure that's as tall as a, a building in, in a lot of downtown centers. Once they created the dam, they also created a reservoir or a lake upstream of the dam for the water to collect. And this is also very, very common. And that reservoir had a total capacity of 355 million cubic meters of water, or just over 142,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So that's a lot of water that's, that's held in this reservoir, which is really, really good for the people downstream that are looking for a more reliable water source. Like we mentioned at the top, the, the areas downstream had had a drought one year and then a severe flood the next. And so, you know, water management seems like something they've been struggling with. So having that that amount of water storage, I think, was a great asset to this area. So let's talk a little bit about the ground conditions that are that are in play during the construction of the dam. So the dam site was made up of basalt and rhyolite, both of which are highly permeable. So it means that there's lots of holes in, the, in these rocks. Um, and they're really less than ideal for dam construction. So the test cores that were collected during the construction process as part of the geotechnical assessment and review revealed a number of fissures, especially on the west side of the dam, that the Bureau planned to seal by injecting grout at high pressure to create what's called a grout curtain. During the excavation process, they found a lot of fissures, some of which were so large that a person could walk inside it. That sounds like a really large fissure. So these fissures are a bit of foreshadowing. They're they're significantly worse on the west side of the dam, and that's the side of the dam that eventually fails. So these fissures are playing a big part in that dam failure. Yeah, so this is probably where the engineering team and the construction team and the bureau should have stopped construction or at least significantly revised their plan. A lot of time when you do design work or you know initial design work, you don't have all of the information because the geotechnical work hasn't been done or you know a stress analysis hasn't been done. So a lot of the time you wind up revising your initial design once or twice, and then you revise your revised design once or twice or three or four times. I mean, Nicole, I'm sure you revise your your HVAC designs multiple times in most buildings just as you know parameters change or the layout of something changes or you know what the space is going to be used for changes or the amount of people that need to be in that space so so revising things is part of the engineering design process it's it's very rare where you will have a project especially a large project i don't even think it's possible on a large project where your initial design is what is going to be built for the final design we try not to redo designs only because it's a lot of it's very costly and usually the engineering fees only allow for us to design it once and not to continually revise the design over and over just want to throw that in there but what we've definitely seen especially with when there's geotech factors involved when we do our foundation groundwater design where we have all the weeping tile going into a weeping tile sump that gets pumped out of the building 
that's typically sized based on initial boreholes from the geotech report and they estimate a flow rate based on how much water that they see from those test ports and sometimes once they dig the hole we find a lot more water Um, we found underwater streams or sometimes it's really close to the river and the boreholes were done in you know the fall or later even later in the summer and then you know the excavation occurs in the middle of the summer or in june when it's when we see a lot of that runoff and the water the water level in the river is higher we'll see more water and so we have to go back and revisit that design and we've actually upsized our pumps on there's one project that's coming to mind right now i think the flow rate it increased at least seven to ten times it was a lot more water than we thought we were going to have initially and so so yeah so we had to revise the design there to account for that so it's it's not uncommon that you have a solid surface you do some tests you think you know what's underneath it and then you start digging and you find out that it's actually different than you thought that's not completely uncommon sometimes with the geotech reports that i've read or just talking to geotechnical people they would love if they could have boreholes every every 10 meters or you know at a at a much tighter interval than what they get but sometimes they 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 can only drill a couple boreholes so they are interpreting a lot between borehole locations or or core hole locations so it's a very tricky science i think to i th- i think to get right and the more information that you can have from geotech the better the designs can be but since all of this happens underground and there's no good way to look at, at exactly how things are underground you just kind of have to take what you can get from the limited amount of boreholes that you have on a project and if you wind up digging a sump or when you when you dig the sump if you find there's more water sometimes it does lead to lead to redesign that's a really good point that i honestly hadn't considered yeah, I just thought they decide how many holes to dig, but there's probably a negotiating process with the contractor and the developer about what they want to pay for excavation. And that then ties back to how realistic the report can be because they're now taking, they're now limiting the type of data or the amount of data that they're going to have. That's a really fantastic point that I had not considered. And I feel silly yeah, and- for not <laughs> considering it. And a lot of the, so when they use a core hole rig or, um, you know, a, a truck based rig, it's, it, it's basically for, for people that haven't done any geotech work or, or, you know, been involved in a project with geotech, it's basically like a, a very long tube of wrapping paper is what the core hole sample winds up being. So they just have this, this very long cylinder, you know, that they'll go down, you know, a set distance, um, usually to a pile depth plus a little bit. Um, so say 30 meters down into the earth on this project, and then they'll pull this this core out. And when it goes back to the lab, they'll they'll you know be able to see the the stratification of of the soil. So you know at at two meters they're going to find some clay, and then at seven meters it's going to you know switch to a different soil substrate or a, or a different type of soil. And then from these these core hole samples that they take, and and there may be you know a couple on a site, or they may have you know. 10 or 20 on a site then they'll build up a whole picture and, and kind of interpret these core hole samples for what the what the soil types look like underneath the project site and sometimes there's just anomalies in the soil that you know they they didn't drill a core hole or you know a core, take a core hole sample from there that wind up causing issues on a project geotechnical work is has always been something that I have, as an outsider, I've always thought was very, very difficult to do and, and even more difficult to get right. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for the guys that do do geotechnical engineering and geotechnical design work because it's uh, it seems like a very hard thing to get right. Yeah, I would agree. I, there are so many unknowns. You know, you're you're getting some data and you're trying to fill in all the blanks based on other data that you may have or may not have. So if you work in geotech and you have a failure you want to talk about and you want to come on our show, email us because we would love to have you on. And you'll have to come on the show because Nicole and I are not geotechnical engineers by any means. Clearly. Clearly we are not qualified. But we'd love to have you on our show if you have a geotechnical engineering failure to talk about. 
Yes. Back to the dam failure, though. Some of these fishes that we were talking about, they were grouted and some were deemed beyond the boundaries required for grout. So the total grout was about 36,000 linear meters of drilled holes and double the amount of grout that they were expecting on this project. So they're already not off to a great start on the geotechnical side. There's a lot of things that are coming up that they hadn't anticipated. This is foreshadowing for what's going to happen. I feel like doubling the amount of grout should have also been a point where they stopped and said, hmm, I wonder if that's going to cause some problems. But remember, this was a very permeable um, surface, very permeable rock there. So it is going to take a significant amount more grout just because there's so many more holes and pockets in all of the soil and the rock that's underneath this site. No, I know, but they, well, they knew it was semi-permeable to begin with. So they hopefully estimated high on the grout. And then once they excavated and started building, they still used twice as much as expected. So that still should have been maybe not a red flag, but a yellow flag to say, hey, this is different. We should think about this for a minute. Am I expecting too much? No, I, I, I don't think you're expecting too much at all. But sometimes they just, you get in a rhythm on a project. Maybe they should have stepped back and, and reassessed. Interestingly, the dam was located in an area of reasonable actively seismic activity. There were five earthquakes that had occurred within a 50 kilometer radius of the dam site in the previous five years. So this is not insignificant. There's seismic activity going on. And projects that I've been involved with were they've been in seismic seismically active regions there's been additional design considerations um, and material considerations that we've had to incorporate into our design just because the area has been active seismically in their defense the dam construction took four years so in theory when they started there was only one earthquake and then there was another earthquake for every year of dam construction if they're linearly spaced which they probably aren't again though that's another point where you stop and you say hmm did we allow for seismic? Probably not. Should we make some adjustments? Yes, we probably should. Did they do that? I don't think they did. And I get it. It's 1976. But like, guys, please try harder. But I feel like size is, I feel like tracking of seismic activity, like that's been going on for quite a while. So I feel they would probably have, I'm going to say 50 years of, of seismic related data for that area that they could you know they could work with a, a lot of the fault lines have been fairly well known for you know a period of time at least you know going back to back to 1976 but either way i i think out of this they probably did need to step back at at this point and you know consider is this design workable from a seismic perspective yeah it's just you know we talk about these failures and it's never one thing it's never this one thing went wrong and everything blew apart. It's this thing happened and then this other thing happened and then this other thing happened and all of these items compound on each other and lead to the failure. So there's always multiple steps and multiple points throughout the process where you can course correct and the course correction just doesn't happen and they just keep carrying on like there's not going to be a problem. And then at the end of the day, they're like, oh shocked Pikachu face the dam collapsed and I just it's so silly but we're also looking at these failures after they've happened and we're also looking at it from this armchair perspective or computer chair perspective of things where we can go through and be like oh man you know what this first thing that happened they should have stopped then or maybe the second or third thing and it and it wouldn't have happened and for whatever reason they didn't stop at the first or second or third or sixth or twelfth thing that did lead to the failure so no that's very true and that is extremely true but People out there listening, and, and even myself in my day-to-day -day engineering career, this gets me thinking about when stuff goes wrong on my projects, or if you're listening, if stuff's going wrong on your projects, this is why we're talking about this kind of stuff, because we want to make sure that we're having this conversation and we're learning from these failures. For this type of thing to happen once is, is kind of part of the process and part of learning but for this to happen multiple times which i'm not saying that it has but if it did happen multiple times that means we're not paying attention and we're not learning from the mistakes that were made before us 
And that's why some of these failures, not specifically this one, but some of them are so frustrating because we had an opportunity to learn from one already and we didn't. And now this other failure happened that was completely preventable, more preventable than the first one, because we knew from the first one that this was a likely outcome and we just ignored it. And it, you know, it really grinds my gears. Can you tell I'm getting, I'm getting heated. And we certainly talked about a number of cladding failures and fires that have happened in, in various buildings. And, you know, we've talked with them multiple times on failureology, and this is episode 51. So certainly these things are, are happening more than, you know, two or three times in the world. And like Nicole said, it is really frustrating when you're repeating the same failure. I mean, if something fails once, you know, that's unfortunate, but it's really unfortunate when it fails two or three or four times in the, in the same way, or, you know, in a way that a pre preventative measure could have mitigated the failure. And it's especially, you know, heartbreaking when people, have, you know, people are dying in the third or fourth or fifth or 20th failure of the same type. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The dam failure was actually so imminent that there were strategically placed cameras around the dam to document the process. So they knew it was going to fail Wait, and they kept Let's slow down it. a second. They knew it was going to fail, so they put cameras up to document it. This is not, maybe it's going to fail. It's like, no, 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 this is totally going to fail. Let's put cameras up. And this is clearly not a, you know, a building implosion where you're planning for, you know, the building to, you know, do this implosion thing where, you know, they place a bunch of charges and dynamite and the, the building collapses in on itself, you know, hopefully in, in the location that it's built on. It's not good when you're when you're new project, you're like, man, that thing is going to fail. We should probably put some cameras up just to just to capture it. After completing the dam in November 1975, they started filling the dam as one does once you've built a dam. And so the standard rate of filling was 300 millimeters a day. But after a heavy snow over the winter, they doubled the filling rate in the spring to accommodate the additional runoff. During the filling period, workers continued to inspect the dam for leaks, didn't find any, and the filling rate was doubled again to 1.2 meters per day six months after filling started. So this is a fill rate of, of four times what they had initially wanted to fill this dam. So let's pause here for a second to talk about water. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in it's in the air and water as water vapor. It, we drink it. We're made of... I don't know, something like 70, 72%. 72% water. Biology is not my strong science. But water is an extremely powerful thing in a really, really impressively dangerous way. In a reservoir type setting, the pressure that's exerted on the dam at the surface of the water would be neutral. But there would be a dynamic impact from the water that's continually coming into the reservoir. Uh, but let's let's consider that static for a second. So let's say that there's just water sitting in the reservoir and we're taking out the dynamic forces from the incoming water. So let's say the pressure at the surface of the water or in theory, the top of the dam is zero. But the deeper and deeper you go in the reservoir and down that wall of the dam, the pressure gets greater and greater. Yeah, it's like the pressure if if you go to a swimming pool or a dive tank and as you go further and further down, your ears start hurting more. There's more pressure on your on your eardrums and your body. It, it's the same thing. The deeper you go down the dam, there's more pressure on the walls. And we call this pressure, this buildup of pressure, we call it head. So it's feet of head or meters of head. I've never built or designed a dam, but we talk about head pressure all the time for piping in a building. And head is measured by the vertical column of water that sits in the piping or on the dam. So if you're... 10 meters below the surface, you have 10 meters of head that's exerted on the dam at that level. And if you go another five meters lower, now you've got 15 meters of head. But remember, the Teton Dam is 93 meters tall. So the pressure that's exerted on the bottom of the dam is 93 meters of head, which is a lot. And it's probably more once you factor in those dynamic forces of the current and bypasses and all of the different things from the water flowing into the dam. We also talked about the fissures and how 
in our opinion, the construction of the dam should have probably stopped when they found those. But I think that there was another huge, huge oversight that was made when they started filling the dam. Because at the time they started filling it, the main outlet and spillway gates were not yet in service. So they had no way to relieve pressure on the dam, either by emergency spillway or through the outlet of the dam, which is, I believe is lower down. They had no way to relieve that water. So if they started filling and they ran into a problem, they had no options. There was no backup plan, no plan B. It was fill or bust. That's, that's what we're doing here. And so there, there were some emergency outlets, but they were way too small. They were only sized for 24 cubic meters per second. And so those weren't enough to accommodate the amount of water that they would have had to relieve once they realized the dam was starting to, to leak. So over the course of June 3rd and 4th, so that's the day before and two days before the dam ultimately failed, three small springs started downstream of the dam on the west side. And as Brian mentioned earlier, the west side is where they saw some of the the larger fissures in the in the groundworks. I don't really know how, but when I was reading the reports, it sounds like they seem surprised that this was happening. I don't know how that's the case. The fissures were there. The soil wasn't the greatest for built for dam building. They were pretty sure the dam was going to leak, so they set up cameras. So I don't know how their surprise this is going to happen, but they are. And even though the dam was almost at capacity, it was 73 meters deep, so about 20 meters from the top, it doesn't appear that they thought there was a problem or enough of a problem at least that they would start to relieve water. So they, even though there was that small emergency outlet that could have relieved just a little bit of water, they didn't use it. So they just kept filling the dam and thought, this will be fine. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. And by 7.30 a.m. on June 5th, 1976, the leak was discharging at 0.57 to 0.85 cubic meters per second. They used bulldozers to try to plug the leak, but they were ultimately unsuccessful. By 11.15 a.m., evacuations started downstream and work crews were forced to flee as the leak was now larger than a swimming pool and it started to swallow their equipment. That's really bad if your equipment just disappears into the ground. It should not be disappearing into the ground. In fact, two bulldozer operators were pulled to safety with ropes. By 11.55 a.m., so 40 minutes later, the crest of the dam sagged and collapsed, and two minutes later, the west third of the dam wall disintegrated, releasing over 57,000 cubic meters of water per second. This is almost three times the flow of Niagara Falls, and that's the Canadian Horseshoe Falls, the good ones, not the ones on the American side, the ones that people take pictures of, those are the Horseshoe Falls on the Canada side, way better than the America side ones. Also, way more water. Tons more water. Either way, if your flow rate is being compared not just to Niagara Falls, but it's exceeding Niagara Falls, that is not a good situation. You probably don't want your project associated with those kind of numbers. By 8 p.m., the dam was empty. So less than nine hours, it takes less than nine hours for the entire dam, the reservoir behind the dam, to have no water in it. That's a lot of water that was there in the morning that is no longer there. Yeah, so it wasn't completely full. It was about 20 meters from the top. But I would guesstimate that it still has about 100,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools in it of water. So that's a lot of water to flow out in a matter of hours. I mean, the dam, I think, had been filling for nine months, maybe almost a year. And within a day, it was empty. That's a lot of water. You do not want to be downstream of that. If you were working night shift, you could have gone to bed with the dam being full or the reservoir behind the dam being full or at least had a lot of water in it. By the time that you woke up after sleeping to go back to your night shift, there was no water. That's a lot has changed over nine hours. Investigators believe that the permeable materials and general flaws in the earth filled dam allowed water to seep through and cause internal erosion that eventually washed out the dam. An investigation panel was unable to determine 
if the erosion was caused by the flow of water under highly erodible and unprotected fill, or the hydraulic fracturing of the core material. One of the quotes from the panel is, the fundamental cause of the failure may be regarded as a combination of geological factors and design decisions that, taken together, permitted the failure to develop. So the Teton Dam failure caused the Bureau of Reclamation to assess all other similar dams, which identified two other dangerous dams. So if there's a positive that comes out of this, it's that there were two other dams that could have failed in the same manner. They were identified. So the dams were the Fontel Dam, which was filled very similarly to the Teton Dam. And in May 1985, they drained the entire dam and reinforced an area of seepage to address a long-running leak. So that's a positive that comes out of this. The other dam is the Jackson Lake Dam, which was susceptible to failure from an earthquake with a magnitude of 5.5 or greater. So the dam was upgraded to withstand a 7.5 magnitude earthquake in 1986 to 1989. This reactionary process had been the norm in other dam failures. The Folsom Dam Gate failure that we covered in episode 26 initiated a safety review and repair of several other dams throughout the U.S. And the Tuz Dam failure in Spain also initiated dam reviews and repairs around the world. We cover the Tuz Dam in a mini failure on our Patreon page that we talked about at the start of the show. We plugged it a little bit. The cost again, $5 a month. That's less than the cost of some fancy coffee or even not fancy coffee at Starbucks. I think it's worthwhile to spend the $5 a month. And you get to hear Nicole and I talk even more about failures. Link in the show notes. So the Teton Dam failure was, like a lot of these, actually like all of these, entirely preventable at many stages. And it impacted thousands of people and livestock throughout the Teton Canyon, about 10 kilometers downstream of the dam site. There was another dam downstream of the Teton Dam on this same river, and that was the American Falls Dam. They had a little bit of time to prepare. Not a lot. They didn't have days, but they did have hours to prepare. And so once they heard of this dam failure, they increased the discharge of their dam Not a lot, but by 5%, they were able to lower their water level before the flood water arrived and their dam held and stopped the flood from progressing. So had they not done that, um, it kind of has a domino effect. So if the first dam fails and the second dam downstream doesn't react, that rush of water may eventually hit the second dam and cause it to overtop or it to collapse. And then it releases all of its water and that can just compound. And so it's really really critical during dam failures that any dam downstream is opened up prematurely as as much as they can to allow them to prepare for this onslaught of water that's on its way to them so there you have it the teton dam failure yet another dam failure that was completely preventable this failure demonstrates what happens when you completely disregard all the evidence in front of you that says this is a bad idea. Maybe I should rethink this. So remember, folks, trust your spidey senses. It knows what it's doing most of the time. Some of the time. For photos, sources, and an episode summary from this week's episode, head to failureology.ca. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please rate, review, and subscribe to Failureology so more people can find us. If you want to chat with us, our Twitter handle is at failureology. You can email us at thefailurologypodcast at gmail.com. You can connect with us on LinkedIn, or you can message us on our Patreon page. And check out the show notes for links to all of these. Thanks everyone for listening, and tune into the next episode where we'll talk about the Luna Park Ghost Ride Fire in Sydney, Australia. Inadequate fire protection systems and a very combustible building allowed a fire to spread quickly throughout the ride. Bye everyone. Talk soon.